Hello, friends. Father Frank Pavone here, National Director of Priests for Life. Welcome to our program, and welcome to another episode in our series examining the arguments on the pro-life side in the Supreme Court case Dobbs versus Jackson coming out of Mississippi and one of the most important cases on abortion that the court has heard since Roe versus Wade. We are talking with the various groups that have submitted friend of the court briefs, and we're looking at the various arguments that they contain. Well, one of our longtime friends and allies in the pro-life and pro-family movement is Concerned Women for America. They have submitted a brief in this case, and today we're happy to be joined by their general counsel, Mario Diaz. He is a constitutional uh, expert. He heads up the organization's legal studies department, and he argues on behalf of the issues that are of such great concern to us, the right to life, religious liberty, family, and so many other crucial issues of our day. Mario Diaz, welcome to our program. An honor to be with you, Father Pavone. So we've got a big case in front of us, don't we? This Dobbs yeah. case. People are very excited about it. And um, I understand that more, more briefs have been submitted to this case uh, uh, than any other of the abortion cases that the court has heard. Yes, there is a, a lot of enthusiasm. I think part of it is the uh, arguments that will be held that... Uh, uh, they go at the at the root of the problem, Roe v. Wade and Casey. And part of it also is the composition of the court uh, with new members that are more open to the arguments that will be brought and also who understand the role of the judge as somebody who is supposed to show judicial restraint and not uh, and delve into the uh, legislative role that has plagued the abortion jurisprudence for a long time, really. Exactly. Well, obviously, a group like Concerned Women for America is going to express concern for women, as uh, you argue before the court. And the brief does exactly that yeah. from a couple of different perspectives. Uh, first of all, and, and I'd like you to explain uh, these arguments for our, our audience. Uh, first of all, the fact that, you know, the court, uh, needs to be giving more attention to the concerns of, of women, the life of women and their unborn child prior to viability. As we know, the court has agreed to answer the question whether protecting the baby in the womb prior to viability would constitute an unconstitutional law. And uh, of course, the question itself, uh, the idea itself seems ridiculous to us uh, that it would be unconstitutional. But that, of course, is the issue before the court. And uh, uh, and then, of course, the brief talks about the um, uh, the attention that needs to be given to the damage abortion does to women. And this, of That's course, right. is an issue that we're very involved in as well with our Rachel's Vineyard and Silent No More uh, yeah. uh, movements. Uh, tell us how you develop these, these arguments in this brief. Yes, uh, I'd be happy to. One of the really egregious things about this case, Father Pabon, is that the court, the lower court, because of the president that the Supreme Court has established, basically ignored all the concerns about women's issues, about what women go through when they experience abortion, something the Supreme Court itself has acknowledged in the Carhartt decision, the partial birth abortion decision, for example. And as a women's organization, we took an exception to this, and it is of the court's own making. And I'll, I'll explain myself. The court has established this pre-viability, post-viability test in, in regards to what a, a state can do in balancing those interests, the, the, the life of the, in, uh, of the unborn, and also uh, the, this right that they have just read into the constitution to, to abortion. And uh, because of that, because you're just looking at the baby and saying, is he pre-viability or post-viability, you can ignore totally uh, the state's interest in, in women's well-being, in women's health. Um, mm. And so they did not allow the state to bring all the, the available evidence that they have of the harms this causes for women. Uh, as a women's organization, Concerned Women for America, I'm not a woman myself, but I represent 
we are the largest public policy organization for women in the nation. And we yeah. consider the omission of the evidence for the state's interest in the mother's health uh, from consideration at the pre-viability stage, for example, a grave misuse of the court's jurisprudence that the Constitution, as you know, does not require at all. Uh, so this omission, I think, is it's egregious, especially also the way the lower court treated uh, those concerns. He basically, the judge, basically uh, uh, charged the state with uh, comparing it to like uh, race, uh, that they just wanted to 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 oppress women. Um, this we believe is it, it, it's unjust, really. It really was, Mario. It really was outrageous the way that they that that the district court in this case uh, treated uh, treated these arguments and treated the state of uh, of Mississippi. And as you say, just this didn't they even use the term gaslighting? Oh, you're yeah. just gaslight. I mean, this is this is what what this is no behavior worthy of a court. Uh, and and to to emphasize too what you're saying, isn't it the case? that even going right back to Roe v. Wade, the court acknowledged that there is an interest on the part of the state in the woman's health and also in that developing life within her, whatever one wants to call that that baby. So it acknowledged these interests of the state, but then sort of tied the state's hands in advocating for those interests, didn't it? That's exactly what they've done, and they've they've done it throughout their abortion cases overall. They continue to affirm that states are able to uh, limit and, and to help women to provide the support that they need, but they constantly second guess what the state does. Uh, women's interests should never be irrelevant to the abortion context, no matter the stage, pre-viability, post-viability. It doesn't matter. CWA represents uh, mothers, daughters, sisters, aunts, friends who have seen the devastation that abortion can have on women's uh, emotional, psychological, and spiritual lives. And we believe the court needs to do a better job of um, taking into account and better, more important, letting the states take those into account. Uh, yeah. That's what we're really talking about here because. Again, the court is, has put itself in an untenable position where they have to be second guessing. Remember, these laws have, have are passed by the people, so the other side has a chance to debate them. Uh, and uh, as you know, what we find uh, in the polling data when people are asked about the specifics of abortion is that they are in favor of limiting strict limits on abortion, especially at the later stages. And so these laws reflect the will of the people, re- reflect the will of women, uh, something you won't hear, you know, in the mainstream media. Um, and uh, it is time for the court to step aside from letting the people uh, reflect the values they hold dear in the public policy. Yes, this deference that the court should give to the states, it seems to me, is a, is a crucially uh, important question, too. Uh, we saw in recent cases, as you know so well, uh, out of Texas and out of Louisiana, uh, right. the court uh, uh, striking down laws that those state legislatures, having investigated, felt were for good for the uh, protection of the health of of women in those states, and so they were regulating the the uh, what the abortion facilities had to do, and you know who is the Supreme Court to to second guess these states? They don't have the the fact finding capability. They're not there close to the situation. Uh, they're not right. having the kinds of, of of hearings that a state legislature can have, and the testimonies and so forth. Uh, so really, a, a very much at issue here, and the brief brings it out, of course, is, uh, you know, let's look at the situation there on the ground, on the local level. Uh, and particularly, this brief does go into those, those physical and psychological damages that women experience from abortion. You know, it makes me think of, of uh, c- cases like when, when Brown versus Board of Education reversed Plessy versus Ferguson on the question of segregation. Plessy right. v. Ferguson had said, oh, separate but equal. But it seems as time went on, they, they didn't take account of the, 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 the damage that is done to, to people in their lived experience 
when you separate them like uh, like our nation did uh, for such a long time. I think there's some kind of a parallel here where the court thinks it's giving a benefit to women by letting them have legal abortion. But right. what you're bringing out here is, wait a second, what is that so-called right to choose doing to the physical and psychological well-being of these women? That's right, which is something the legislature, the state legislatures are capable much more uh, in tune with what is happening with the population, even after the choice. As you said, we are pro-life and we have shown how we are interested in women, not only before they make a decision, women who have had an abortion, that does not erase their pregnancy. They were mothers. And the feelings that they get, that sense of loss, of mourning, they are pretty much abandoned by the other side once the decision, their pro-choice, right, their so-called choice has been made. And it is um, groups, like as you have mentioned, uh, that, that come to their aid and acknowledge that sense of loss. Um, and the state should be able to take that pain into account, to take those consequences of a choice, to want to invest in women feeling empowered to make any choice they want to make. But what we see from the other side and what we've seen for, from the court, um, sadly, has been that it, it has spent little time taking into consideration those accounts. Remember, when in 1973, when Roe came along, the internet wasn't invented. <laughs> the microwave right. was not invented, right? Apple computers are nowhere to be seen. And it is amazing that still today we are letting those outdated ideas control the abortion jurisprudence, control abortion policy, because sadly that's what the Supreme Court is doing. It's acting as a super legislature and intersecting itself into the abortion policy making. And, and I think it's time for them to recognize that they are outdated that they are inhumane. Now that we have seen with the advent on 3D imaging in ultrasound, uh, most people can take a look into the womb and see what is happening there. That is what was um, what is troubling to them uh, about this Texas law, as you, as you made reference to, right? Because it talks about the heartbeat. And most people understand that a heartbeat represents a life. And yes. I saw, I, I, I saw uh, one of the abortionists talking about cardiac um, movement or, or cardiac uh, 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 assistance. Yeah, he can't bring himself to talk about the heart. Exactly. The heartbeat because yeah. he understands. I think we all have a conscience. So I think that it's time for the Supreme Court to uh, be um, more honest about what it has done wrong. I think they have already acknowledged it, right? In Casey, they abandoned their reasoning in Roe and refuse to, to overturn it outright just for political reasons, really, uh, right. worrying about the, the, the reputation of the, of the court. And it is right. time for them to, to, to do the, the right thing here and acknowledge that uh, there are many more considerations at play here and women's health, not only before the decision, but after the decision should be a big factor. Well, and, and, and this brief uh, uh, assertion of that damage that abortion does to women corresponds also, as you know, to something the court said in Gonzalez v. v. Carhartt, where it uh, acknowledged, it said it right. is, it's indisputable that some women come to regret their choice. Uh, right. And we know that in, their, in this case, there are a number of other briefs, in, including the one we submitted, uh, that show the testimonies of of the women the talking about all the pain and the grief and the uh, uh, both physical and psychological uh, after effects. So it's something that the court needs to listen to, needs to take into account. Um, the other thing that 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 this brief uh, goes into uh, the very strong point is the court must never assume that all women have the same yeah. position on abortion. That's right. uh, you know, concerned women for America is a is a gigantic group. Uh, you've got hundreds of thousands of uh, members across this nation, and uh, uh, we to to think that to be a woman is to automatically be in favor of abortion is such an egregious fallacy. Um, yeah. And and the brief uh, uh, goes into that uh, as an argument, doesn't it? 
Yes, it, it is one of the reasons why Concerned Women for America exists today. Uh, Beverly LaHaye started the organization back when the Equal Rights Amendment was going on. And, and that was the narrative that you heard in the media. This is what we meant, what women want. And she said, no, they don't represent me. And she wanted to establish uh, a, a conservative, uh, a, a really a Christian worldview of, of women. And so right. the hundreds of thousands of women we represent uh, through this brief stress to the court that women do, do not need abortion to, to have equality. This is sort of the narrative that is underpinning behind their abortion um, uh, narrative that, that this is what women need in order to be equal to men. Um, and and we, we take that head on. We say that women have intrinsic dignity and value uh, regardless of the uh, of abortion public policy, that they do not need abortion uh, in order to 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 establish their worth, uh, and that the fact that we, that men do not give birth is not something they see as a flaw, some disadvantage, uh, as go the, their narrative, but but it is a feature of the beautiful way that women are created, the imago dei, um, that uh, that is to be celebrated and and supported. That being a mother is not uh, to women's detriment, but uh, despite the many challenges that it had, but that um, it is to be celebrated. Uh, that is to celebrate true diversity, the diversity of our creator. And therefore, uh, CWA affirms the dignity of women, all women, including the women uh, who are unborn, which is another of those um, uh, incredible truths that we don't see dis uh, discussed in the media. You know, we've tried for a long time, for example, pass laws uh, against abortion uh, for uh, sex relations, right? For 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 gender, right? right. So that and and the other side fights us on that too. Uh, we've tried it in in terms of race, right? Uh, to prohibit abortion uh, because of race, and they fight us on that too. They want no limits on abortion whatsoever, regardless of how reasonable they are. And I think the Supreme Court, up until now has really aided and abetted that idea. They have been complicit in every time, you know, the one time that this has been different has been in this uh, Texas law that just passed. And you have seen yeah. how they have exploded. And the, yes. the difference was that the Supreme Court refused to inject itself. This law passed and now they came to them with an emergency appeal and the Supreme Court simply said, we're not gonna interfere, we're gonna let the process play out. And they have gone like the sky has fallen. It is not, right? Um, and I think that's the what's encouraging about the Dobbs case. We have some justices now who are a little bit more introspective. Um, and they have a lot to, to hang on to. If, if you remember, even Ruth Bader Ginsburg acknowledged that what they did in Roe did not solve anything. They thought the argument would be solved and we would sort of move on from that. And she right. recognized that it had really damaged, damaged the argument because it didn't allow people to debate the really important issues. When does life begin? How much it is valued? All those things are things we need to, uh, again, have the freedom to engage in. Texas should have the freedom. Mississippi should have the freedom to establish the balancing um, of, of the interest here in a way that is different from from another state. Um, right. And so we hope the Supreme Court will have that uh, better view this time around as they hear the Dobbs case. Well, it certainly is a, a, a crucial moment. It's a tremendous opportunity. And uh, we're grateful for the voice of CWA. Uh, uh, friends, if you're uh, just joining us, we've been talking with uh, Mario Diaz, General Counsel for Concerned Women for America, this brief, this excellent uh, set of arguments here on behalf of women before the court. So, Mario, are you, uh, I mean, uh, 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 we've seen a lot of changes uh, over these uh, over these decades. Uh, the court has weakened and, and stepped away in various ways uh, from Roe v. Wade. Um, uh, are you as excited as I am by uh, by what this what is about to unfold here as we we hear these arguments and uh, look forward to some kind of change, hopefully in the right direction from the court. I am, uh, and as as you are, I'm a, a Christian man who believes in the power of prayer. 
And one of the yes. things I have told our grassroots uh, women who are just uh, the salt of the earth, uh, Father, I have told them that I want them to feel um, the power of those other leaders around the country praying for this case. But not only that, I, I told them I want them to feel the millions of prayer that have yeah. come, have gone on since 1973. Just think you've been part of this movement. You're a hero to us. You, you know the millions of prayer that have gone hours and hours praying to God to deliver us from this stronghold that the enemy has had on our country. And I think we need to sort of connect with that past. And we are all now fighting this. And that's what really gives me the hope more than the legal arguments. I think um, those prayers that have gone, I think have led us to this point. And I am excited about the composition of the court again, not because they are, or, or the majority of them are pro-life and they will impose their will, but because I think they are able to see the injustice that happened in Roe with Casey. And I think that they, they are being asked to continue what most people, including many liberal scholars who recognize that it is just in this area of law that all of a sudden all the judicial norms are put to the side in order to save um, uh, this, this constitutional right to abortion that was just invented out of thin air. Uh, so I think what, what we have is that we have some people that are committed to the constitution and they won't uh, be activists in any way, but I think I'm hopeful that uh, many of them will be able to find uh, the courage to say what is true, what they know to be true, what we know to be true. Uh, but I encourage your audience also to, to continue to pray. I think it is one thing to sort of make these arguments in the abstract, and it is another thing to be a justice of the Supreme Court and sign your name and, and know that it's gonna cause some turmoil. So I think they will need, their, their sort of uh, moral and judicial compass will be tested. And I think they need our support, they need our prayers. Um, and we are certainly engaging in it. We have developed a 30 days of prayer campaign that we're starting October 1st, as soon as the, the court starts hearing arguments. And we're gonna continue up until the day that decision is handed down that um, we might see so the justice prevail. That is awesome. And, and I presume people can find that. We have your website up on the screen. They can find that prayer campaign at your website, cwfa.org. Yes, that is true. Concernwomen.org, cwfa.org. They can come in and, and sign up and get all the resources. We want people engaged. And uh, especially, again, if you're a woman, this is uh, an organization that will stand with uh, Christ's principles on life and liberty, as you said, and family. Uh, many fights, uh, but uh, we're encouraged by what God is doing. And so are we. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mario Diaz, uh, General Counsel for Concerned Women for America. Thank you for explaining the brief. Uh, thank you for sharing with us uh, CWA's mission and vision. And thanks for that call to prayer as well. We look forward to uh, continuing to stand shoulder to shoulder with you and with all the great people at Concerned Women for America. And thank you. And thank you, brothers and sisters, for watching this episode. Uh, remember, you can also go to SupremeCourtVictory.com to uh, find the uh, many briefs that have been submitted in this court to understand the, the case better and to uh, also find prayers that you can say for victory in this case. Thanks so much for watching. Father Frank Pavone here of Priests for Life. We will talk to you soon.